I'm Melissa Keeney, the Director of Corporate Engagement and Impact for EarthShare in North Carolina. Um, bear with me today as my, I have an awful cough and I'm hoping my voice lasts through the webinar, <laughs> but we will see. Um, and just in case uh, y'all haven't been to one of these, I, they were launched uh, last year or the year before, um, just to, during campaign season, to educate our corporate partners and state employees and really anyone who wants to learn more about our local North Carolina based nonprofits and their work um, and ways to support our work and uh, their work this campaign <clears throat> campaign season, excuse me. <clears throat> so EarthShare North Carolina uh, was founded 30 years ago. This is our 30th anniversary, which was really exciting. Um, it was founded by a group of nonprofits that wanted to better connect people to the environment and the conservation movement. And we do this through workplace giving campaigns, as I mentioned, and our employee engagement programs, which is now the corporate partner program. Um, you can look for us in your workplace giving campaign. Um, I don't think we have any state employees on here, but uh, we also manage the state employee combined campaign. Um, and you can look us up with the code 1100. And then here is our EIN. Um, so feel free to look for us all donations through um, through workplace giving campaigns, 100% that, excuse me, 100% of that is donated directly to our member nonprofits. Um, if you have any questions about our corporate partner program or our work or anything else, um, feel free to email me at any time, melissa at earthsharenc.org. Just a little bit more information about our impact. We have 23 North Carolina based nonprofits and then over 70 national nonprofits all working to protect our water, our land, our wildlife, um, our air, and of course, creating equitable spaces and taking climate action. And here are all of those wonderful uh, member nonprofits. They're all listed on our website if you want to take a, a greater look at the names and their websites. And without further ado, uh, our two wonderful member nonprofit representatives with us today are Meg Fensel and Jordan Calloway. And please correct me if I said your name wrong at, at all. Um, we're going to start with uh, Meg with Sassine Charlotte uh, for about eight minutes, and we'll have a few minutes of questions and then turn it over to Jordan. Uh, and feel free to put any questions in the chat throughout the presentations, and we'll revisit them at the end. So I will turn it over to you, Meg. All right. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. I'm uh, really excited to be with all of you here today, and hopefully it's not as rainy wherever you are as it is in Charlotte. Um, but nevertheless, what a great way to spend some time together over lunch. So Sustain Charlotte was founded in 2010 here in Charlotte, and we are working to inspire choices that lead to a healthy, equitable, and vibrant community for generations to come. So what I want to do today is just give a brief introduction to Sustain Charlotte, but really tell you more about one of our new programs to equip advocates. So the, the challenge that we're facing in Mecklenburg County and really in much of North Carolina is, is a lot of environmental, social, and economic sustainability challenges related to our very rapid population growth. And as you can see from this chart, our population really took off in the middle part of the 20th century. And that's important because that was the time when cars had been invented and, and widespread adoption of automobiles had already occurred. So we have a very um, sprawling land use pattern in Mecklenburg County, and that's created a lot of dependence on cars. And with that comes a lot of environmental challenges with our air quality, water quality, tree canopy, but it's also created uh, equity challenges. So it's estimated that we'll have about 400,000 new residents just in the city of Charlotte by 2040. That raises questions about where people will live, how we'll be able to get around, whether people will have access to their daily destinations like jobs, education, parks, healthy food. What will the air quality be like, the water quality? Will we have enough water to sustain this population and our businesses? And will we still have forests and healthy urban tree canopy? This is what our region looked like in 1976. So this is Mecklenburg County in the center with the, the white star showing the city of Charlotte. And at that time, 95% of our land was forest and farmland. And so most of the population lived around the center of Charlotte and in the small towns. And then there was also some 
rural population, but we hadn't really seen much sprawl in 1976. And these are maps from the U uh, UNC Charlotte Center for Applied GIS Science. Now I'm gonna show you what the situation would look like by 2030 if we continue the development patterns that we have been engaging in over the past few decades. So by 2030, if we continue to sprawl, we will be at 41% developed land and only 50% sorry, 57% forest and farmland in our region. So we are all about trying to grow in a more sustainable and equitable way so that we all have access to a healthy environment and great opportunities without needing to drive a car. So we are really trying to ask the question, how can we do better as a community? What if we really valued walking, biking, and public transportation as freedom, as tools to connect people to opportunity and to support a healthy environment? And we do that through an approach called smart growth, which is really about building our community in such a way that a car is an option rather than a necessity to reach our daily destination. So smart growth community has safe places to walk and ride bikes and cross streets. It has fast, frequent, reliable public transportation. And it also has a mix of building uses so that we don't have all of our housing in one part of the city and all of our businesses and offices in another part. So it makes it easier for people to get around at a more human scale. So what we realized is that the work that we do is very focused on advocating for change, for better policies, better plans and implementation of those plans and a, a, a budget that really supports uh, smart growth. And so we recognize that there's a little bit of a learning curve to do this work. And we've been hearing from a lot of our members that they really wanted to learn how to become effective advocates for smart growth. So we decided to build the Impact 704 Academy. And it's the first time that we're doing this. We just had the first session last week. The first session, it was focused on the that overall topic of smart growth, just introducing people to the work that we do and why it's so important that we grow in a sustainable way. So we'll do two more sessions in November and December. One will be focused on transportation, all those sustainable ways to get around. And the other one will be focused on how we are growing as a community. So taking a look at land use and development. So I wanna share a bit with you about how we structure the Academy very intentionally to be equitable and accessible for as many people as possible. We really wanted this to be an in-person event so that we can give people an opportunity to engage and, and meet their neighbors, to meet us, to meet our subject matter expert speakers. We also recognize that for some people coming to an in-person event is a barrier. So we also stream this on Facebook Live and share it on YouTube. We have worked to create a lineup of expert speakers. So that includes both our own staff, but also speakers from academia. This is uh, Professor Deborah Ryan from the UNC Charlotte, who is a professor of architecture. So she and I both spoke about smart growth at this first event. We'll also have speakers from local government and from businesses. We wanted the venue to be accessible. So we have several people that attended in wheelchairs and made, made sure that they that we reached out to them um, with arrival and information. So, you know, accessible in the sense of people of all ages and abilities feeling comfortable and being able to get to the venue. But we also made sure that because we were focusing on walking, biking, and public transit, that this was an event that people didn't need a car to get to. So we held it at Camp North End, which is a really cool mixed use site just north of Charlotte's uptown area. Um, and it's it's proven to be a pretty popular venue. We also wanted this event to be family friendly. We know that for some people finding childcare in the evenings could be challenging. So we intentionally marketed it. Um, even though the subject matter is geared towards adults, we we brought some games and we made it clear that that families are welcome. So several people <laughs> brought their kids and this little guy stuck a sticker on his forehead. We also recognize it sounds like a small thing, but just being able to connect over a meal is really important. There's something special that happens when people share food together and, and kind of break the ice over a meal. Not to mention at the end of a, a long work day or whatever we've been doing earlier in the day, it's nice just to, to sit down with a, a taco and not have to worry about dinner before or after. We also felt it was really important to center the participants and give them opportunities to engage. So we had question and answer periods, but we also did a group exercise at the end, asking participants to reflect on how easy it is to get around in their own communities. And is, is are there different types of land uses within their neighborhood? So the first step of becoming an advocate is 
really taking a look at the situation in, in one's own community so that we can understand what it is that is working well, what's not working well, and how we can advocate. We also did an interactive exercise several times throughout the presentation just to really make sure people stayed engaged during the part of the event that was more lecture style. So we had five times where we asked trivia questions. So this one was, what is the single strongest predictor of whether a family escapes poverty? And the answer was commute time. So we used a variety of techniques to make the event as accessible as possible for people to participate in different ways to break down some of the barriers that might typically prevent a person from being able to participate, and then also to connect them with the subject matter as well as to the, the speakers and to each other. So hopefully that was a, a, a high level, but um, maybe detailed <laughs> overview of what we've been doing. We also host other events that we use to engage advocates. One of these is our Growing Our Greenways initiative. And this is the, uh, the final one that we'll be doing of this year. We've done five at Greenways throughout Mecklenburg County, really to advocate for completing the county's Greenway network faster so that people in all parts of our community have safe places to walk and ride bikes, whether they're doing it for fun or for transportation, and just really to enjoy that easy access to nature. And we're also hosting an event. This will be our eighth time doing it, Biketoberfest, which is about exploring Charlotte by bicycle so that we don't have to be as dependent on cars. And we had about 600 people last year. So we're hoping for a great turnout again this year. So be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Meg. Uh, feel free to put any questions in the chat or come off mute. I just have a, a silly question because I, I love Biketoberfest. What is what is your favorite part of Biketoberfest? <laughs> I just love seeing people almost become like children again. And a lot of people do bring their kids, but for many people, maybe they've just ridden their bikes around their neighborhood or their bike has been sitting in their garage getting dusty for the past few years or months. But uh, just seeing people come out there and there's just something joyful about being able to run your errands or or get around to your usual daily destinations without a car and and getting on a bike and getting exercise and seeing so many other hundreds of people out there doing the same thing on the same day it really has a kind of fun party like atmosphere to it and it makes me think how much more joyful our community could be if we had more opportunities to do that every day and in other parts of the city beyond uptown and south end where it is relatively easy to ride easy and safe to ride a bicycle that's not the case for all parts of our city mm -hmm. absolutely i know there's a uh, bike meetups in the triangle that i go to to it's it's just so much easier and and safer feeling when you can bike around with a group of people and get used to that before you do it on your own so i think that's wonderful Awesome. Looks like we have no questions in the chat. Um, Meg, if you want to drop your email in the chat, just for anyone that wants to reach out later on, um, that would be great. And with that, um, I will pass it over to Jordan. <laughs> great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, apologies if my internet becomes unstable again, but I'm certainly going to give it a go. So I'm going to share my screen. You sound great right now. So. Okay, terrific. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, and you're seeing my screen just fine now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So this is a really great dichotomy. I'm so glad you put uh, Meg and I together. So it's really interesting to compare our two organizations and our goals um, for North Carolinians and how we can make it a better place. So I, I fully support all that Meg and Shannon and the staff are doing at Sustain Charlotte. I think it's an awesome organization. So I'm glad we're paired together. But the reason I mentioned it's a dichotomy is because I'm here today to talk to you about the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is a national park um, that its most dominant feature is a motor road. Um, but of course, the Blue Ridge Parkway goes through uh, some of the most beautiful natural features in North America. Um, it's actually the, the mountainous region that we run through is the most biologically diverse part of uh, 
definitely the United States, if, if not the entire globe. So um, these mountains are 400 million years old. So it's very important that we not only um, preserve the motor road experience, but also the natural resources that it runs through. So uh, again, I'm Jordan Calloway, and I'm with the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, and um, we are a nonprofit that's been around since 1997. So we're celebrating our 25th year, and uh, we were founded to support our national park, which is the Blue Ridge Parkway. You may not be aware that the parkway is a national park, but it is a, a a national park since the 1930s and it was a WPA project. It was a way to get people back to work after the depression in terms of the construction of the parkway, the stone walls, the bridges and so on. And it was also a way to preserve the natural resources that it runs through. So um, it's wonderful work. We're thrilled to do this work and let's see if my slide will proceed. Very slowly, there we go. So I wanted to share a bit with you about what we do. So uh, as I mentioned, the main feature of our park is the motor road, uh, the 469 mile road that runs through North Carolina and Virginia. And in North Carolina, we run through about 17 counties in the Western part of the state. But we also <clears throat> feature 369 miles of trails. So this is the part that I would like to focus on with you today. So the natural resources that you're able to enjoy whenever you visit the parkway, which uh, has no entrance fee, no parking fee, uh, unlike many national parks where I went to some national parks in California this summer, I had to re reserve my parking spot a month ahead of time, pay for my parking, et cetera. So anyway, this national park is free, open to everyone. It actually brings a huge amount of income into the state of North Carolina. Um, we are the most visited national park in the United States. So we have more visitors than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon combined. Um, it's hard to appreciate in this size of a park. It's so huge, you might not necessarily run into these crowds, but we do welcome uh, 14 to 15 million visitors every year. And those visitors bring money. So um, it's whether they're a driver, a, a hiker, or a cyclist. Um, Meg was talking about cyclists the Blue Ridge Parkway is wildly popular with bicyclists. It has a lot of highs and lows, so it makes it really fun for people when they're riding. So this, this motor road runs through um, some of the most biologically uh, diverse areas in the US, and we feel that it's worth protecting for future generations. So we're not just protecting um, the experience for the visitor, but we're protecting the resources that it runs through. So we, the way that we seek out funding is through donations, but also through our plate. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the Blue Ridge Parkway specialty plate, but we were, I believe, the second specialty plate introduced in the state of North Carolina. And so that provides a tremendous amount of funding for us to be able to help support the parkway each year. So it's very important to us, and we're very thankful to have this partnership with the state of North Carolina to be able to provide these resources to our national park. So using resources such as that, we can help protect the Blue Ridge Parkway, which many use as a sanctuary and escape. Um, it's a source of pride for people that live in the communities. I personally am uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina and Forsyth County, but for the, the counties that the Blue Ridge Parkway runs through, it brings in international visitors. It brings in people from all over the US, but also it's a national park in your backyard. So you don't have to take a plane to get there. Um, you can get there within a day if you're in the state of North Carolina. So it's something that we can all enjoy. So while we work to uh, present new programs and projects for the Blue Ridge Parkway, such as this is a, a shower house that we built for campers, um, we support campgrounds, picnic areas, and so on. These are visitor improvements that help provide a better experience for visitors and also helps protect the resource. If you don't have a bathroom there, where do you think they're going to go? So um, it's these are necessities uh, to help protect the area. But we do have a program called Trails and Views Forever, which is intended to um, help better the experience for our guests and help protect the natural resources. So um, we do have, as I said, 369 miles of trails on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And they're, while they're really spectacular for the visitor and we want to have a great experience for them, we also want to protect the area that you're walking through. So we have some programs within Trails and Views Forever where we work with volunteers and use donor funding to help protect those resources. We also, in our Trails and Views Forever program, we're working on um, 
dealing with some of our deferred maintenance. We have a huge, literally um, millions of hundreds of millions of dollars in deferred maintenance. So when you visit the parkway, you might unfortunately be greeted by scenes such as this, which isn't very welcoming for this 15 million guests. So we do have the Trails and Views Forever program, as I mentioned, but the program within that that I wanted to share with you today is something called our Rover program. And so this is something that we have at uh, three different pilot sites. We just kicked it off this year. And what we're doing is three sites, Craggy Gardens, which um, some of you may have been able to enjoy visiting, Rough Ridge, and let me get to the next slide. Rough Ridge, which is near Boone or Blowing Rock, North Carolina and Devil's Courthouse, which is southwest of Asheville. So we utilize volunteer rovers at the, these sites and uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation has provided funding for this. So you might think, what do you need funding for for volunteers? So with these volunteers, we need to outfit them. They're usually out there on their own. Uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, their staff, the Flat Hats, the park rangers, you may not see them on the parkway because there's only so many of them and it's such a huge massive area. So luckily we're able to use people within the community to serve as rovers. And what they do is we've identified these three sites as ecologically important sites. And so the rovers there have been outfitted by the foundation thanks to donor funding. And they're outfitted with a backpack. And what they have in their backpack is a first aid kit, they have a, a notebook that's something that we call, they're called write in rain notebooks. So basically if it's raining out there, it's not a regular paper notebook. And they're also outfitted with a radio for safety purposes. But it may sound like a minimal effort, but it's extremely important. So they're there to keep people on the trail. When you go off the trail, you risk trampling species. So these three sites have uh, federally endangered species within them. So Devil's Courthouse, um, the species that's there is the spreading uh, avens, but there's also peregrine falcons just off the cliff. So when people climb over this wall, we risk them um, endangering the nests, uh, doing something to jeopardize the species. So it's really critically important that the rover's there because trust me, when somebody sees a wall like that, the first thing they wanna do is climb on it. And then they step over it and then they begin to potentially impact the natural species in the area. So as I said, Devil's Courthouse is where we um, have peregrine falcons. Um, so they're there to protect that species. I'll work backwards. And then at Rough Ridge, um, we have the federally listed Heller's Blazing Star, which is a rare plant that we wanna keep them on the trail um, and not off the trail and trampling the species. And then the species that you find at Craggy Gardens is the mountain avens and canes reed grass. So they're there to not just, they have the first aid kit in case something happens. Um, we actually had a rover where someone fell and separated their shoulder and they were able to use the walkie talkie and radio for help. But they're also there to keep people on the trail. And they're, they're also I, helping them identify the species in the area, helping educate the visitor and helping provide a better experience. So I will go back through so you can see what one of our volunteer rovers looks like. So he looks very much like a ranger. Um, so I think that helps provide some respect for these folks out on the parkway. Um, we have volunteers of all ages that work in this program. Uh, they very proudly wear the patch. Um, we have volunteers in Parks Patch that we put on all the materials that we have purchased for them. And it's been a wonderful experience. I hope we can utilize them in other sites of the parkway to help, help protect the natural resources along the Blue Ridge Parkway. So we utilize volunteers and trail crews of all shapes and sizes. Um, our Rough Ridge site, which is near Boone, and that means it's near Appalachian State, we're able to utilize a lot of college volunteers there. So we welcome college age volunteers and trail crew members to help with various parkway projects. Um, this group here is on the left there at Rough Ridge, which I referred to earlier. And on the right, you can see them on the steps of uh, the Moses Cone Estate in Blowing Rock. So we, we utilize volunteers for uh, work days, such as a kickoff for the parkway season and also for regular maintenance of our trails. It's a huge amount of work to be able to maintain 369 miles of trails. And we deal a lot with trail erosion. So while you may be on the parkway and flying by, 45 miles or less, right? Uh, flying by, you can appreciate the fact that off the, off the motor road, um, there are these wonderful trails that are worthy of our care and protection. 
So we're able to collaborate with uh, trail crews for these projects. We work with other groups throughout North Carolina, such as the Carolina Mountain Club, and we work with um, different ACE crews to help provide these services. And what the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation does is help find the grant funding, find the donor funding, and direct it to these valuable projects. So we we do hundreds of projects up and down the parkway and provide over a million dollars of support to the Blue Ridge Parkway every year. I just wanted to share one sort of snapshot of a project where you may visit Craggy and see one of these rovers and so you could appreciate what they're there to do. It might seem like they're just there to, you know, provide directions or uh, help give you a Band-Aid or whatever, but they're really doing critical, important work because if they don't do it, we're going to lose these species, that we're going to lose these rare plant species, and we're going to lose the animal species in the area. So um, I'm so glad that we can support this work. We also do other projects. I mentioned earlier about the shower houses, bathroom projects. Um, we built we build bridge. This is the bridge that we built on the Boone Fork Loop Trail. So we're all about creating a better visitor experience, but protecting the resource. That's the primary priority for us. So um, I have my name and contact information here. I can put them in the notes as well, but I welcome any questions. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, I am trying to find my video here. <laughs> um, in the chat, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come off mute or put your question in the chat and I can read it aloud. And I know also we're at 1230, um, so I don't wanna hold anyone up. Um, let's see, it looks like Erin asked, are there any plans to add a bike lane to the Blue Ridge Parkway motor road? That's a great question. It is a great question. So while I mentioned it's terribly popular uh, with cyclists and one of my uh, coworkers here in the <clears throat> office has ridden it end to end, it is, it's dangerous. You know, it, it really can be dangerous in some places where um, we have the switchbacks that people don't see cyclists. So um, while I'd like to think they would add a bike lane, um, I, I, Realistically, I'm not sure that that would happen in the near future, but it would be amazing, especially around certain parts of Asheville, where it's very popular and people are, are going way over the speed limit on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, but we do ask that, you know, drivers give the cyclists enough space. Um, we do have bike safety messages on our site and on the park site, but um, it, it would be wonderful. And I'll definitely share that thought that there should be a bike lane. Um, I'm just not sure if they have the capacity at this time, but it's a wonderful suggestion. And we also have been working to provide water sources along the parkway. That's something that cyclists have come to us about, especially if they're riding some distance because you're not going, you're not on a road where there's a, a gas station, not any longer there used to be, but uh, you're not in an area where you're gonna happen upon a convenience store or something. So even if it's just a hose, you know, we, but we have been working to bring back the historic water fountains along the parkway to provide support for cyclists. Thanks for your question, Erin. <clears throat> well, I will um, actually, Jordan, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat, just for anyone that has any questions pop up. Um, and we are over 1230, so I don't wanna hold anyone any longer, um, but I do wanna thank you all for tuning in today. And this recording will be um, promoted to everyone. If you wanna share it with your, your colleagues, your friends, your family. Um, I will also put my email in the chat. If you have any questions about um, what Earthshare North Carolina does, um, what our coalition does, how to better support our work and our members. And I think that's it. So thanks again for joining and thank you, Megan Jordan for um, sharing about your work and for um, doing the great work. We appreciate it. Happy to be Thank here. Thank you. Bye.